All of my friends come to see me last night. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. I met Peter for the first time last uh, summer when Kathy, my wife, and I uh, strolled into his bookstore at Vineyard Haven in, on Martha's Vineyard. And I was uh, looking at his book, uh, The Eye and I, Pictures of My, My Generation, and it reminded me that he had spent time in, uh, in Vermont in the, early, in the early 70s, living at one of the uh, communes, uh, Tree Frog Farm, which many of you are familiar with and probably some of you live there. Um, so I introduced myself to uh, Peter and immediately invited him to Brattleboro because that's what I do, you know, when I'm out, I invite people to give talks and, and uh, I guess in a uh, fit of uh, <laughs> reverie or whatever or nostalgia, he said, sure, I'll come up. Uh, he had been here in 2010 uh, for an uh, exhibit at the Vermont Center for, for Photography, uh, which was a show called Vermont Hippies from the 70s. And uh, he um, um, uh, exhibited his uh, work at that time. So at any rate, after a couple of emails after I got home, we finally decided on a date uh, in November. Well, as that date approached, unfortunately, uh, Peter got ill and couldn't make it. So we had to reschedule, and we went back and forth, back and forth, and finally we decided on April 27th. Well, then it was my turn to, and I didn't get sick, but I had to leave town uh, was at a, for a conference in April. So we um, uh, canceled again, and tonight we have uh, Peter here, finally. So uh, just in a, in a way of a short introduction, um, uh, Peter is a uh, nationally acclaimed photographer, photojournalist, mm -hmm author and music historian and oh yes he does uh, teach as well he, uh, he instructs in his, in his craft in his 40-year career he has documented everything from the spirit of free love the protest movements of the 60s and more recently the occupy movement rock and rollers whom i'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar with major league baseball which is a uh, a passion of mine I, it's probably a Brooklyn Dodgers slash Mets fan now, and of course uh, the beauty of his residence, uh, Martha's Vineyard. His work has appeared in many newspapers and magazines over his career, including Time, Newsweek, Atlantic Monthly, Village Voice, and others. He has nine books uh, that include the one published in 2001, The I and I, Pictures of My Generation. This book includes int introductory essays by his sister, Carly Simon, and the vin and vineyard author of some renown, Richard North Patterson, among other, other authors have written the introductions. The I and I is retrospective of uh, Peter's work. The day it was to be released, he had five television appearances scheduled throughout the day, beginning with an appearance on Good Morning America. It was going to be the book release of his lifetime. Unfortunately, the day that was released was September 11, 2001. And all of his scheduled appearances were canceled, as you can imagine. So at any rate, um, he's been uh, trying to <laughs> put that behind him, I think, for the last uh, 12 years. His book is an incredible photographic history of our times and should be in, in your collections, uh, and uh, especially if you have an interest in uh, uh, modern American history. It's in my personal collection and it's in the library's collection. And I hope you might consider purchasing a copy. Uh, Peter has made a long trip from the vineyard, and I must say we don't pay uh, a great uh, honorarium here, so uh, um, I hope that you do um, you know, uh, decide to purchase a book. And I think, thank Peter for being so generous with his time. So I hope you uh, will welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Peter to Brattleboro again. Thank you for that great introduction, Jerry. And uh, is the microphone working yeah. spectacularly? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the interesting thing about coming back to Brattleboro is that part of my history is that I lived not far from Brattleboro for two, for two years, uh, from 1970 to 72. And I, <clears throat> with a good friend of mine from that era named Harry, who's in the back row there, uh, we co-bought a farm together in Guilford and experimented with going back to the land and living communally uh, with about 15 or so friends from college, mostly from the Cambridge, Boston area. And so uh, you'll be seeing a lot of photos from that era tonight. <clears throat> so that's kind of, it makes me feel very nostalgic coming back here. Uh, city's changed, of course, quite a bit in 30 years or whatever it's been, but um, 
it still has, there's still a grit and the character of the town that I remember quite well. And you mentioned the Latches Hotel. Um, that we always made fun of that hotel when we were living on the commune because it was like people that we invited to stay at, at the hippie commune would, some of them were, were uh, parents or relatives and they'd come to the farm yeah, I'd have like a little cot set up for them or something to crash in the living room or whatever we had. And they took one look around and went, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm talking about older people. I mean, I was in my early 20s and these are people in their 30s and 40s. And so we would make a reservation at the Latches Hotel for them. Uh, and we sort of predicted who would be a Latches candidate and who wouldn't be. So it kind of became a little bit of an in-joke there. So I see it's still there. Well, as Jerry mentioned, um, I've published a lot of books in my life, but the second to most recent is called I and I Pictures of My Generation. And this is uh, a group of us hippies in Vermont at the commune as we were dressed up to go to our annual May Day celebration, which I understand took place again a few, like last weekend. I uh, wasn't there for it, but it must have been very nostalgic. Um, now, I photographed this two-year experience of living communally almost as though I was a photojournalist photographing my own life and <coughs> the lives of all of my friends. And that's been kind of the way my whole photography approach has been all the way back to when I first started taking pictures, which was uh, 1962. So if you count the years, this is my 50th year of being a photographer, which uh, is some cause for celebration. So uh, I followed in the footsteps of my father, who was a publisher. In fact, that's a picture of him right there. I kind of looked like him, actually. Um, and unfortunately, he died when I was very young. I was only 12, and he died of um, complications from heart attacks and strokes. And as you can see, he was a chain smoker. Um, and he also co-founded Simon & Schuster, the publishing company. So I grew up, with, grew up with a lot of famous authors and musicians and very high quality, uh, creative, artistic people roaming around our household from when I was just a little kid. And uh, so I grew up in this um, very creative uh, and ambitious home. And my father, besides being a publisher of great renown, uh, he, I say great and renowned because he invented the whole idea of a photography book. He published the first real photography book ever called The Decisive Moment by Henri Cartier-Bresson in the mid-50s. And he also came out with the first children's book, Golden, it was called The Golden Books. He also published the first crossword puzzle book. And he also published the first paperback book. He was a very innovative man. And um, little did I know this at the time, because I was so young. Uh, but he also took me into his dark room and taught me how to develop film. And I watched him be the master wizard of Oz, it seemed to me, in the dark room, developing his film and showing me how pictures would evolve out of the tray of chemicals where it would, he'd stick in a blank sheet of paper and slowly but surely a picture would emerge. And, you know, I was six, seven, eight, nine during this, and you can imagine how exciting it was for me to see this process and see this genius at work. Uh, photography was not a profession, but it was an evocation. So I saw him photographing family, friends, famous people, the mundane to the ridiculous to the sublime, and I just sort of observed him. And then the sad part of it is that he uh, developed heart disease due to smoking and been feeling just an enormous amount of pressure from family and friends and business. And so the last couple of years he became, um, he had dementia. I guess it wasn't Alzheimer's disease, but it could have been. He acted like that. And one day when I was about 11, he called me into his bedroom. By then he was kind of bedridden. And he said, son, I, I can no longer work at Simon & Schuster. 
Um, so I've retired and I expect you to work there as of t tomorrow morning. And here I was 11 years old. <laughs> and uh, I said, but daddy, my voice hasn't even changed yet. No one's going to do anything I tell them to do. He said, don't worry, just put on your seersucker suit, which he had bought me, a cord jacket, and uh, show up to work and you're my son and everyone expects you to take over the company. <laughs> so he had, you know, he was delusional and it was one of his, you know, just one of the things that he really thought was real. So I got very frightened by this and uh, I really, it was very scary for me. I mean, it's humorous, but it was frightening. And my mother happened to walk into the bedroom during this conversation and she she'd seen him go off on a tangent like this before with other people and things so she sort of took me aside and said now P darling your father is having one of his awake dreams and just don't put on the suit and just go to school tomorrow like a normal kid I said Phew, okay <laughs> uh, meanwhile I was a very insecure kid and uh, I had three gorgeous sisters one of whom turned out to be Carly Simon, the singer. Um, she being the closest, closest in age to me, but there were two others that were equally as uh, charismatic. And uh, I felt like the runt of the litter and uh, never was good in school, uh, had no at, uh, athletic prowess, and felt really, I had the worst self-esteem and they didn't use the word bullied back then, but now I can say that I was severely bullied because of my buck teeth and uh, my inability to be socially at ease with people. I had a few close friends, but I, I just felt very inadequate. And uh, my father's death in the, when I was 12 didn't help. But he left behind all this great legacy of negatives and a dark room and cameras and chemicals and and so I immediately just felt well I got to follow in his footsteps that's, that's it the, it's the the blueprint is there and so uh, wasn't long before I started developing my own film and taking my own pictures and this was around 1961 60 61 and I'd go to school with my camera it was a it was a Leica that I inherited um, and I'd take pictures of my classmates who uh, thought I was weird taking all these pictures, but then I would go home and develop and print them and bring them to school the next day, all these nice eight by 10 prints. And suddenly people took note of this and thought, well, this Peter Simon, he might be creepy, but he certainly <laughs> can bring in good pictures. <laughs> and so I developed immediately my self-esteem shot up. And, um, I suddenly felt, well, this is really my true calling, and no, I can't play football, and no, I hate ancient history and uh, algebra, I can't figure that out at all, and uh, I'm weird and awkward, but at least I can take pictures. So that's where it all began. It began in the early 60s, and I, at that point I was living in Riverdale, New York, which is a suburb of New York City. So what you're gonna see tonight and I thank you all for coming, this is a nice turnout, um, is the progression of my life as I've lived it through my eye, through my eye and eye. And uh, as Harry will attest, I really went about photographing everything that seemed interesting within my own sphere. I did, uh, even though I photographed it, I also lived it. So it's called participatory photojournalism. And I only photographed the things that really interested me and so were in my sphere of influence. And uh, I did get a lot of magazine assignments and did a lot of books. And, but there were always things, about, things I cared about. I didn't go out and take pictures of fashion models or pictures of you know corporate CEOs for annual reports. I didn't do the kind of stuff that you really make money at in photography. I, I shunned that and I took photojournalism really seriously and I thought that that was what I wanted to do. So fortunately, because of my background, my mother 
plied me with all the chemicals and the cameras and the film and the paper that I needed. She was very supportive of this burgeoning talent of mine. So uh, I didn't really need to go out and earn money right off the bat. But I knew that I wanted to be a photographer really early on. And um, had my father lived longer, I think probably what would, would have happened is I would have gone into Simon & Schuster and assumed an imprint there. And I still have regrets about that. But um, I don't have any regrets about the life I've lived. And I'm here to share a lot of it with you tonight. So that's, those are my introductory remarks. And um, as the slides <laughs> progress, I will stop as each, e this book is divided into about 12 chapters and I'm gonna be going through this book chapter by chapter more or less. But this came out on 9-11 as Jerry mentioned. So there's about four new chapters that aren't in this book, and uh, so I'll save those for the end. It all basically is chronological. And uh, we'll take it one chapter at a time. So as mentioned, this is a picture of my father. It was taken by Philippe Halsman, who's a well-known, was a well-known studio photographer. He photographed a lot of the famous people of that era. And this is very reminiscent of the way studio photography was done in the 50s where it's like a, that studio-esque background and portrait lighting with a little top lighting which shines off my father's bald head and um, you can see a little <coughs> shadowing on this side so the light is three-quarters front lighting and that, that's just a, has a real stu has like a real 50s look to it and uh, you don't see studio photography like that anymore unless it's being done that way for a reason. So, I'm going to move along. And this is a picture of my family taken by my father on a tripod. Um, he ran into the picture and here's my sister Lucy. That's me in the foreground, probably about five. That's my sister Carly. Not a particularly great expression on her face. That's my oldest sister, Joanna. That's my mother, Andrea, who came from, I mean, I, there's, there's been some discussion about her having both Cuban blood and black blood from her, on her grandmother's side. She looks kind of, I don't know, she looks a mixed breed, I guess you could say, or as Obama would say, a mutt. But um, she was very charismatic and very beautiful. Because of my father's influence in the world at that point, he gave me access, or had access, to famous people of that era, one of whom was Jackie Robinson, the famous baseball player who broke the color barrier and played for the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1947. And that's his son, Jackie Jr., who was my age. But you can see that he's much further along in his physical development than me at that point. But he took me under his wing and taught me baseball. And uh, The Robinson family was having a hard time getting uh, any property or housing at that point in white neighborhoods. And they wanted to move out of Brooklyn and into Stamford, Connecticut, which is where we had a summer home in that period of time. And when my mother heard that the Robinsons were not going to be shown any property in Stanford because real estate brokers just didn't want them to ruin the neighborhoods, my mother really took it upon herself to make sure that uh, the Robinsons did find a piece of property, and they did, and built a home in 1955 near our home. And while it was being built, my mother and father invited the Robinsons to come and live at our home in Connecticut. So. I had this amazing opportunity, very young, of being a huge Dodger fan and then having Jackie come home at the end of his day and tell me all about the game and how he stole home plate and how he was mad at the umpire for, take, for giving him a call's third strike. And it was really hands-on, first-class information from Jackie Robinson. And uh, as my father aged and died, then Jackie took over and was a surrogate father for me and spent a lot of time teaching me sports and golf and I'm very indebted to this man and feel very blessed that I had such a great early on experience with such a great ball player. This is in the Dodger dugout at Evans Field.
Now this is the first picture I ever took. It's of my father, taken in Riverdale, and I just brought his camera with me and asked him to teach me what to do. I asked him to, uh, I said, Dad, I want to take a picture of you. And he said, all right, well, just grab the camera and she'll be walking up the street. It was kind of a foggy night. And he was about, this is about, uh, I'd say 1959. So it was a couple years before he died. But that's the first picture that I ever took. And I think it really is a good shot considering how young I was. Now I mentioned that I had had three gorgeous sisters, and I spent a lot of time photographing them. And that's Carly, the youngest one, and that's her dog, Lorelei Brown. And they were, loved being photographed by me. Um, they were, well, they'd been used to their father photographing them all the time, so I was just an extension of that. And that's my middle sister, her name is Lucy. She's now 70, but here she's about 16. And uh, she went on to have a good, a very nice career uh, writing songs for Broadway musicals, one of which is called The Secret Garden, that some of you may have heard of. And that's my oldest sister, Joanna Simon, who had a career as an opera singer. And then later on in life, she became a real estate broker. And there's a very interesting story about who she wound up being with. Uh, for the last five years of his life, a well-known person. And I will keep you in suspense until we get to that portion of the slideshow <laughs> of who she wound up with. First she got married, then her husband died, and this maid of hers later on, his wife died almost simultaneously. I'll get to that story. I'm going to keep you in suspense. That's the three of them um, in our yard in Riverdale, New York. And this kind of epitomizes this sense of closeness that we all felt as a family. And the barefoot, the dogs, the cherry blossoms in the background. It was a very nice suburban area that we lived in. I have a lot of very fond memories of that era. This was taken at the Bronx Zoo. And uh, this picture won an award, actually, from Kodak as the best photograph that a student had ever taken for that year, 1962. And uh, it just, the, f the thing about the picture that I like is how it, it looks like Mr. and Mrs. Orangutan kind of at home inviting us, me in for tea or something. Okay, so I went to the Riverdale Country School for boys and this picture was taken the day that JFK was killed in 63. And uh, here we are watching, I think that's Walter Cronkite on TV, announcing his death to us, to us all. And we were just in a state of shock. I also got a chance to hear Martin Luther King speak at my high school. And I was a very naive kid uh, growing up in an all-white neighborhood. I, it never occurred to me that there were people less fortunate than myself and my friends. And when he came and spoke, he described a lot about what um, black people in the South had to go through in terms of discrimination and segregation. And it was just uh, his description of the third world part of America was just uh, shocking to me. And uh, he was, of course, a very inspirational orator. So at the end, I went up to him and shook his hand, and I said, Dr. King, you've changed my life forever. And I actually started crying, because it really, I was so very emotional about it. And he reached over and gave me a little pat and said, well, I'm glad, I'm glad that your world has opened up to us and all that we've gone through. And it really did. So this is one of my most treasured pictures that I actually got a chance to photograph this man. And I photographed Robert Kennedy while he was um, campaigning for Congress in Riverdale, New York. This is, Riverdale's part of the Bronx, for those of you that don't know. It's, um, it's kind of the wealthy section of the Bronx. And this is on Johnson Avenue, which is kind of a nondescript place. Um, and he was there just 
doing the campaign thing. And I, uh, by that point, was photographing for our local newspaper, the Riverdale Press. And so, uh, this is 1964. This picture has that real early 60s look to it, the way people are dressed. And this picture was taken in Riverdale also. Um, I was asked to photograph, take a photograph for the cover of that newspaper, the Riverdale Press, uh, to uh, go along with an article about what it was like to be black and living in Riverdale, which is an all-white neighborhood, or was. And so I found a black student from my school, which was integrated, and uh, had him pose behind a street light on a foggy night right in front of my house. And this picture won a lot of acclaim at the time because it was so uh, eerie. I left Riverdale in 1965 and moved to Boston University, Boston rather, and went to Boston University as a student majoring in photojournalism. And uh, the first assignment I had once I got to BU, I worked for the BU News, which is our student newspaper, which was the first liberal, radical student newspaper to ever emerge. It was the, you know, the underground press. To, in a sense, even though it was an administratively supported publication, but we students took it over pretty quickly, and uh, the editor of the, at the time was a guy called Ray Mungo, who was very uh, advanced in his thinking. And he actually lived at in Brattleboro, in Guilford, with me for two years, or three years even. But at this point, he was the editor of the Be Your News, and he said, go take a picture of McNamara, he's going to be speaking, speaking at Harvard today, and even though it's BU, I want you to take it at Harvard, because I bet there's going to be protests there. And I didn't even know what protests were. I, I, didn't, I was like, tell you, I was really naive. And when I went to Harvard, I saw all these signs, and the media crush, and people confronting him about the war, and why don't we get out of Vietnam, and it was like, wow, a whole world opened up to me. But I was right front and center. I positioned myself really well because he was just walking out of, this, uh, out of Harvard, the administrative office, I guess. And he was really confronted and didn't expect it. You can see he's not too pleased. The young Ted Kennedy came and lectured at BU. I had a chance to photograph all these people while they were coming through, um, and when you look back at these pictures, you know, I didn't know what his life would become, but I'm glad I got this picture of him, like he's so young and handsome. And there's Eugene McCarthy. Wow. We had great hopes for him. And that's Dr. Benjamin Spock, the baby doctor. All these pictures were taken for the BU News, by the way. I was their uh, chief photographer. By the time I was a sophomore at BU, I pushed everyone else aside and became photo editor really quickly. <laughs> and that's taken at a protest in Boston, and that's Abby Hoffman, double exposed. Around that time, I took a trip to Virginia and couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that there was motels just for colored people. I just, I couldn't believe it. Um, so I took this, it was, it's not a, it's rather crudely taken, it was that night, as I was driving by, uh, but it really opened my eyes. Shortly thereafter, there was a, an event in Washington called the Resurrection City Brigade, where a lot of people came up from the south in Birmingham and, you know, points south from Washington and pitched tents and, the protest was for equal rights and justice for all. And Martin Luther King spoke at this event. And this is uh, the march that we had down the reflecting pond in Washington, which I don't think anyone's really done that since then, just got right into the pond there. And this similarly is at a protest in, uh, at the UN in New York. I got very involved in left-wing politics and wanted to photograph every single event I could. Uh, Be-ins, love-ins, anti-war demonstrations. Uh, I was very much, very politically influenced by Ray Mungo and 
uh, we were all afraid of being drafted too, I have to say. And so the students got very involved in the anti-war movement because we didn't want to go fight in a war that we didn't believe in, but we were, you know, it wasn't a voluntary army at that point. This was perhaps the biggest uh, demonstration of that era. It was called Moratorium Day, taken in Washington, this picture on November 23rd, 1969. Was anyone at this event? You were. There were 250 or 300,000 people there that day. And um, our whole agenda was to levitate the, the Pentagon. <laughs> It was there too. <laughs> um, I mean, what did we think? It was like the Occupy movement of today, you know. Our thinking was not that realistic, but we did go down thinking we would just bring the Pentagon off the ground. Um, this picture was taken, I kind of took my life into my own hands in a way because I wanted to get above the crowd, and I noticed that there was a TV camera way up on a scaffolding, and I just started climbing up the scaffolding with my camera not even a ladder or anything, and I hung on to the scaffolding like this and took a few pictures. And, you know, I, I wasn't that athletic, and if I'd let go with my fingers at all, I would have gone plummeting to the ground. I was about maybe 20 feet off the ground here. But I knew I wanted to get an overall shot, and there was, their foreboding clouds were there, and I, I just, I consider this my best anti-war shot that I ever took. And there was a moment uh, in 1968 at BU when LBJ announced that he was not going to run for president. And we saw this as a big victory at the time because it meant that someone was going to get elected who would end the war. Because LBJ was for the war. So there was a very spontaneous celebration on, in the streets of Boston. Like we really felt that we had, it was a tremendous victory here. Little did we know but Nixon was going to get elected, it was going to get worse. But that's part of that spontaneous celebration near Kenmore Square in Boston. And as I mentioned, there were a lot of be-ins and love-ins and huggings going on between strangers, with kids getting caught in the fray there. Similarly, um, at a Grateful Dead concert. And this is um, in Boston, in Boston Gardens. On a spring day, springtime afternoon uh, on a Sunday, all the students around the area, MIT, Harvard, Emerson, BU, Northeastern, BC, all the students collected to celebrate the Summer of Love. I think this was the year after the Summer of Love, but we still felt loving. <laughs> And then there was the backlash of people that didn't believe in uh, all that we were doing. Uh, the right-wingers thought we were nuts. This picture I call Sign Wars was taken at another demonstration in Boston where they're really two opposing political views. Uh, one of uh, uh, pro stick type on your left and then the guy on the right was the, trying to get us all out of the park and get out of here go back home and so they said let's fight so he started a fight with the guy with the sign <laughs> so they started fighting with these, each other's signs symbolically and we, as I said we were very afraid of getting drafted and turned in our draft cards, a lot of us did, including myself. Um, this was taken at the Arlington Street Church in Boston. And we made a big to-do about the fact that we were burning our draft cards. And I burned mine. And later on, the FBI came and investigated me. And for a while there, I thought I was going to be dragged off to jail, but I somehow talked my way out of it. And this is on the outside looking in along Commonwealth Avenue during yet another protest. Then, towards the late 60s, the protests started getting more violent and uh, militant, very much like the Occupy movement got in the fall, where it wasn't just a, you know, let's change the government, let's change our culture, 
through discussion uh, that became very much civil disobedience and then riots. And here's one at MIT. I didn't like that part of the peace movement. Because I always felt for, for peace, we should be peaceful. And that kind of sums up the summer of 68. And this is taken out in Berkeley. I took a trip to California in early 68 to see what the West Coast was up to, which always seemed about five years ahead of the East Coast at that point. And Rolling Stone magazine had started by that point, so I visited their offices. This was our Bible. Late 60s, everyone waited for their Rolling Stone to come out. It was a magazine of our culture. And I went to Haight-Ashbury. This is back in Boston. This picture is uh, manipulated in the dark room. I, I don't do this much, but I put the uh, paper in the easel and then slowly rotated the easel around to create a circle of confusion on purpose. And uh, I kind of like that effect. But I, I don't do it much, but I think it works there. Here I am on the front lines, getting back to that day where we were going to try to levitate the pet Pentagon. Here are all the military police all lined up to stop us from levitating. <laughs> <laughs> and I was scared. I was right there, right, right on the, as you can see, I'm right in the front line there. And I thought at any moment, someone was going to make a false move and there was going to be a bloodshed. You can see we were scared and we were white. <laughs> skin was white, we were so scared. But instead of uh, shooting us, they just decided to set off t tear gas canisters instead to, to disperse us. So I don't know how I got this picture because my eyes were tearing and so burned and red. And, but I wanted to document what it was like to be involved in a tear gas um, episode. They didn't have tasers at that point, I guess, just tear gas. Back home in Boston, I saw the dichotomy between religion and war. And it seemed uh, very ironic to have these two signs juxtaposed. Around that time, the women's movement started to gain ground also. And women felt that they wanted all parts of their bodies to e be equally recognized, not just their breast or vagina or clitoris, even though they're important, but they felt that men only saw women as sex objects. So that was the purpose of that little demonstration. I was in Cambridge. This picture is an ironic photograph taken by, uh, in Cambridge of my two roommates where we acted out the horror of the killing of four kids in Ohio, Kent State. It was kind of a bizarre photograph that I took. Uh, and I wanted to portray the kind of brutal, callous attitude that these cops had. Like, just burn them all, chop them down. And then when the students went on strike that year, that was 1970, who remembers that? A couple of you. Um, I was supposed to graduate in 1970, and I never did, because we struck, never got to graduate. Uh, and I finally graduated two years ago. BU asked me back. <laughs> <laughs> and I went down the aisle with my cap and gown and got my diploma. It was really nice to be you did that. <laughs> it was closure after 40 years or whatever it was. And uh, I, at the time, was glad I didn't have to do that because I was really a hippie by then. And the whole idea of a formal thing where you had to get dressed up and behave like a normal human being. I didn't want to do it. None of, them, none of my friends wanted to do that. So I was happy then, but now I'm glad that they gave me a second chance. There was a riot in uh, Harvard Square after that. Kent State killing. 
And this woman doesn't know if she's coming or going. And there's a shit-eating grin. <laughs> Who wants him back again? This woman was beaten and clubbed by police for wearing the American flag, which was her father's gift to her as he died from wounds in Vietnam. He came back from the war in Vietnam and died. Before he did, he gave this flag and said to his daughter Jennifer, I want you to wear this flag as a protest against the war. So she went around Boston wearing this, and she was to told to take it off by police, and she wouldn't. So you can see that she's wearing a neck brace here. And they, they tried to force it off her, and it created a big furor in Boston. And this picture made the cover of the, Boston, of the Rolling Stone magazine. And her name is Jennifer Thomas. I'm wondering whatever happened to her. And around that time, the, wood, the movie Woodstock came out. And uh, I never went to Woodstock, by the way. I wish I had. You were there? Yeah. Lucky you. Did you like it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was living on Martha's Vineyard in the summer of 69 and uh, couldn't get off the, I literally could not get off the island to make this event, but I wish I had. But by the time 1970 rolled around and the movie came out, this was the first, what we felt, uh, exploitation of the hippie movement. And big corporations were co-opting our culture and made a movie and we're going to make money out of it. So you can see that we're not all that impressed with the fact that Woodstock came out as a movie. And this is a flash forward. I just stuck this in because it's relevant. This was taken just before he went into the war in Iraq. And we were all very against this, as most intelligent people were. But it didn't stop a thing, did it? This is taken on the vineyard. Now this is a funny picture. This is a, a cop flashing me the peace sign. Here I am probably barefoot, full of long hair and hippie clothes. And it's kind of a, I think he was going, ha, to me. And uh, I snapped it. Because we didn't like cops at that point at all. I mean, they were the enemy. Pigs, we call them. And uh, then this book, this picture was published in my book, I and I. And his, this person's son saw it, uh, who was about 20 or 21 at the time, and recognized his father. And said, that's my dad. And I didn't say that to me, but he must have said that. And he brought it back to his father and showed it to him. And his father called me up on the phone and said, I see that you have a picture of me in the book. And I just want to tell you, at the time I was against well, all you had to stand for, but now I'm all for it. I'm really glad you took, you took this picture. And he paid me $150 to send him a copy of it. <laughs> so what goes around comes around. So that ends the political section of the show tonight. And now I'm going to get into this little uh, chapter called City Life. I got very depressed living in cities by the late 60s, and the whole political movement was starting to get too violent. And I'd been very affected by the photographs of a guy called Robert Frank, who came over from Germany and took a lot of pictures and put out a book called The Americans that was very negative about how ugly a society we were, how decrepit our cities were, and how fat and ugly and deranged most of our citizens were. And this came out in the mid-60s. And I copied his style for this next set of pictures because I developed a very uh, caustic view about city life. And I was getting ready to move to Vermont also. So I was psyching myself up to take the, the most depressing pictures I could of any city that I went to. So this was taken in Pennsylvania. Of someone down now. That's her sister taken up in Boston. Here are everyday people waiting for a bus in San Francisco. Actually, this isn't that depressing a picture, but it's, it's very much like the photographs by that guy, Robert Frank, of kind of like the people just kind of like getting through life without any joy. 
That's a slightly similar picture taken in Philadelphia of a drunk sleep on the top of a railing, innocent kids below. This is rural, actually. It's taken in Virginia, the outskirts of D.C. Of all these people lived in that one little ramshackle house. This was taken to support an article about the homeless in Boston. Even though this guy wasn't homeless, I posed him as such. Who's ever heard of Moondog? Hey, we got an educated crowd here. <laughs> so he was like the penultimate uh, hippie uh, freak who rambled around on the streets of New York in the mid to late 60s. And his agenda was like, we should be recognized for being hippies and different and not be scorned. So he was on the street corner and at the, at the time, that's my mother, the charismatic woman that you saw earlier on. After my father died, she took up with this young stud who was 20 <laughs> years younger than she. And so I asked him to just stand next to him, and I got this very interesting uh, con contrast between the haves and the have-nots, or whatever you want to say, the alternative culture and the straight culture. I love taking pictures like that. I still do. And this is Central Park. And... Uh, I call this the only living boy in New York after a Paul Simon song. Here's one solitary person surrounded by all of this gargantuan mess. And I thought, wow, what, a, what an amazingly busy city this is, and yet here's a guy completely isolated. This is just a typical of street in America in Philadelphia. This is pretty self-explanatory. Taken in Roxbury. And this is waiting for the tea in Boston on Com Ave. This is taken at MIT. What I like about this picture is how the lines all <coughs> vertical and horizontal all kind of mesh together. This is just a grab, what we call a grab shot. It wasn't posed. It, I just saw it unfold in front of me and took the picture at the right moment. I call this shot location, location, location. <laughs> and that's the New York City skyline from my point of view at that point. This is a picture of a girlfriend of mine from that era who said, if you take me to one more demonstration, I'm going to break up with you. And if you don't move to Vermont with all your hippie friends, I'm going to go, I'm just going to leave you. And I didn't like that because I really loved her. So after all these demonstrations and all the city ugliness, I thought, okay, I'm off to Vermont. We weren't quite there yet, but um, here's a picture of this old timer who just scorned us hippies at big time. There's something happening here, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones, is what I call that picture. And this was taken at Harvard Square. So away I went. And now we're going to move into the hippie commune phase of the evening. It's 1969 or thereabouts. And I decided to take the money and run away to the hills of old Vermont with Harry and friends. And my guru, Ray Mungo, was, had already beaten me to the punch. And he was already living there at a place called Packer Corners. Who's ever heard of that commune? Ah. Well, he founded the commune, and I lend, loaned him $5,000 to buy the piece of property, which he paid back. 
And uh, it was kind of a rundown little farmhouse way out in the sticks of Guilford. And I thought, this is crazy. How are they going to live here without any electricity and plumbing? And... But somehow they made it. Harry and I bought a nicer house that had central air conditioning and a couple of bathrooms, <laughs> a washing machine. We were made fun of by the real true hippies for being too middle class. So this is the original group of us um, in Guilford. That's myself, Ray, Michelle, Richard Wyszewski, Marty Jeezer, Miranda Porsche, and what's that guy's name? Remember? Laurie? Laurie Dodge. Laurie Dodge, yeah. Who committed suicide, I think. Miranda still lives in the area. Yeah. yeah. And lives right there. She threw a great name day last Saturday. Say what? She threw a great name day. Yeah, I heard about it. I, I wish I'd gone to it. This is that girl who said, if you don't move to Vermont, I'm leaving you. But now she's much more in her own element. The wheel of life, I call this. And we grew our own vegetables. We were so proud of ourselves. Who thought that us hippies could actually do something functional like that? And this was a little goodbye love circle. That's that same girl again on LSD enjoying, enjoying the milkweed. <laughs> Much more so than the demonstrations. Here she is <laughs> tripping. <laughs> and even our animals got stoned. <laughs> my old Volvo. And that's Veranda. This is like a still life comedic shot. Like a still from a comedy movie. And there's Richard Wyszewski and Peter Gould and Doug Parker who's no longer with us. You know, all in all, I have to say, it was a wonderful experience living out there in the hills of old Vermont. But I did give up my career as a photographer in Boston. I was well on my way to a rather um, successful, I believe, career because the Boston Globe had offered me a job to be their full-time staff photographer. So it was quite a choice that I had to make. But I also felt that I had to follow my instinct and that was to get away from the city. So I kind of put everything on pause, spent two years in the neck of the woods here. And here we are at May Day, circa 1970. And that's the farmhouse that we bought. How does that look now, by the way? Different? Yeah. It's a little spiffed up. Spiffed up? Yeah. It's been yuppified. Day in the life in the big barn Smoking cigarettes, almost everyone smoked cigarettes back then. I hated it, because my father died from it. And here we are in my bedroom at Tree Frog Farm, we're watching television. I believe we were watching news about the war in Vietnam. And there's Harry in the background. Do you remember what we were watching? No. You don't remember. <laughs> Something on TV. I had a color TV in my room, by the way, and everyone made fun of it, as though I was still too attached to my earthly goods. But then they would come in and watch it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> this is the first year of our experience living in Vermont, and this was our Christmas card. We are family. The thing that I didn't like about Vermont was how cold it got in the winter. I did not expect this to happen, as I come from a relatively more moderate climate of New York and Boston. Not that it was warm, but you didn't get inundated and snowbound like this. And weeks would go by when we couldn't even leave the house because we were so far down the road. 
and this is 10 degrees in the middle of the day, and I just, I couldn't, I just couldn't take it. <laughs> Although some of us enjoy the day, days by going snowshoeing. This looks like straight out of Dr. Chicago. <laughs> and that's Don McLean with his Jeep. Is he still around? Oh, yeah. yeah. The Jeep's still around. Jeep's still around. <laughs> <laughs> There's a group shot of the two communes combined. That's Harry here. That's myself, Lori, Richard, Ray, Marty, Connie, Ellen. Ra Ralph? Don McClain. Don Miranda and Michael Geese. Elliot Blender and Dale. And Eeyore. Is that Eeyore? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is the cover of my book, which I showed you earlier. Um, this girl is now probably about 40 years old. 43. 43? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, we were all just dressed up at our May Day best, tripping our way up the road to May Day. Now, I don't, I'm not a, Jenny, this girl, Jenny, still lives around here. Uh, Marsha has become a Hasidic Jew, and I don't, haven't talked to her in years. That's Kim Rosen, is now a lawyer living in Northampton. And this is a girl named Pepper who lives on the West Coast. When we moved to Vermont, we lost, loved the idea of having animals, but we didn't know what to do with them all. <laughs> <laughs> chaos would rain. <laughs> <laughs> but we sure did know how to grow our own. <laughs> That's me, by the way. We had fun with our animals. We believed we could develop real communication. <laughs> Loved our horses. Loved dressing up in white. Having fun. Let's see, who am I still in touch with? Kiki lives in Hawaii. She's a librarian. Doug has passed away, but he was a Art, graphic arts teacher, uh, designer. That's Catherine? Yes. She lives in Hartford. That's Peter Strong, he lives on a commune in Oregon. That's a girl named Sandy who, uh, I'm not quite sure what happened to her. She was my girlfriend at the time. And that's Harry. Harry, you're in a lot of these shots. <laughs> and that's Miranda with, what was the name of that cow? We had a name for it. I don't remember. There he is again. And this is our house that we had in uh, Guilford called the, John, what was it called? Tree the house? Frog. What? Tree Frog. No, 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 I meant the, the property. We had a name for it. Um, who owned it before us? Or? Maybe they, they used to call it the white place. That's right. And it's white. But it was called Tree Frog Farm. How did we get that name? Do you remember? Comic book. Comic book. Yeah. <laughs> Occasionally our animals would rebel against us. That same girl, Nancy, who didn't like the communes, didn't like getting butted either. One day we went up to the attic at the old house um, that we bought and found all these great clothes in the attic and uh, the gals put them on. Thanksgiving, our first Thanksgiving together as a commune. My mother was very mad at me for not coming home that particular year. And there's Michelle and the daisies. And this wasn't on the commune, but um, I got very interested in this nude commune that I went to, where everyone walked around nude all day. That was their whole way of life. And they, it was very convivial. 
but you'd walk into there and they'd be all nude and they'd offer me tea and coffee or whatever. And then I became a nudist. I still am to a certain extent. And then we took this nudity and brought it back to the farm. And I would say in the summertime, and on any given day, about half of us were nude. But it wasn't any big deal. It wasn't unusual. It was just part of the way we lived. I mean, nowadays you look at this and think it's funny, but at the time it was just like, oh, hum. Right, Harry? Wasn't it when we liked this, generally speaking? A lot of naked hippies running around. Yeah. <laughs> People would drive up and down the road to get a look. <laughs> <laughs> Even the winter is nudity. And this is the annual badminton tournament that the ladies would have. So now we're going to switch gears. We left Vermont. I sold the place to Harry in the fall of 72 and took that money and bought a house on Martha's Vineyard. Also with a lot of electricity and plumbing, but uh, put it in. But I carried my nudity, my passion for being naked, to the vineyard where there are a lot of nude beaches. So this next section is all about what it's like to be naked in front of people you don't even know or people you do and um, I still take pictures of light like that because it still happens although people are a lot older now but they don't seem to care and uh, this is not a particularly sexual experience it's more just more a sense of freedom and familiarity and liberation from clothes this I call beauty and the beast <laughs> And this, there were, one beach on Cape Cod was about to be shut down for uh, too many nude people and they tried to kick us all off and then there was a big protest movement one day. This is on the vineyard. This is the amazing birch trees in Vermont. This is a hand-colored picture. And this is on the video. One of my few pictures that is posed of new people. This is kind of getting right back down to the bottom line here. I am hungry. I just love the way his little fingers is clutching that woman's breast. <laughs> well, we did have hot tubs. And wine. Yeah, and wine. <laughs> this is on the beach on Martha's Vineyard. My wife is one of the women in this picture, but she doesn't want me to tell you which one. <laughs> <laughs> That's this woman named Alicia Bay Laurel who put out a bunch of cookbooks and New Age books at the time. She fell in love with me, but it wasn't mutual. Sorry to say. And that's Catherine with her daughter Michelle, who you saw in the foreground of that other picture. Now this was taken in Florida, where they have an annual nudathon where you go down for a week and there are all these workshops and I taught a, a workshop on how to take pictures of people naked and make them feel at home and I was able to do so. <laughs> this is some kind of odd parlor game that was being played. <laughs> parlor. And this is canoeing. <laughs> Now, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, a few years ago there was a whole group of people that would get nude right here in Brattleboro, yeah. in a parking lot or something, right? Yeah. Whatever happened to that? Yeah. It just kind of <laughs> it fizzled winter out. Winter. What happened? Winter. Winter. Oh, it happens again in the summer. 
No, they, they passed the law. They passed oh, they passed an ordinance. Okay. That was a flash in the pan. Oh. <laughs> now this is, uh, had to read the Boston Globe, no matter if you're new or not. This is just a grab shot at a alternative media conference, actually, in um, Goddard College. Then I went to Woodstock 99, which was held uh, in upstate New York, and people started to emulate what it was like to be a hippie in 69. But it was all much more um, exhibitionist, and it didn't have the sense of reality that we shared. We did it all. But they were just trying to like pretend that they were reliving 69, but it came out, coming, it came out like this. It wasn't for real. And this is taken more recently on the video of a woman that was just posing like that um, for the hell of it. And I had to take a picture. Why not? On the vineyard, there are these beautiful cliffs that are made out of multicolored clay. And you can go up to the cliffs and take the clay and spread it all, all over the place. Sorry about that. They're where we are in the clay pits. Now this is off limits now because of its ecological uh, component that it would that caused too many mudslides. But back in the day, we certainly enjoyed going in there. This is a funny shot. <laughs> I was um, on the beach with a bunch of friends, including the folk singer Tom Rush. And uh, all of a sudden, the paddy wagon came down and arrested us for decent exposure. Someone had um, complained. So they, the paddy wagon came in. Some of us were taken off to jail, or we were told we were being taken to jail. And they, then the paddy wagon got stuck in the sand. <laughs> so we just hopped out and bumped it along. And then we got back in, those of us that had the clothes on. <laughs> I don't see him in this particular shot. But he was in jail with me. And he let him brought his guitar into this tiny little cell. Um, and he took out the guitar and he played the Urge for Going, which I thought was apropos, considering it was eight of us all in a tiny cell. I just think the idea of us hopping out of the Jeep and helping them get out of the rut is just funny. That's yoga on the beach. And that's at a tribal bonfire. And now I'm switching gears from the nude section. I have a lot more of those pictures, but I just figured enough is enough. You get the idea. Um, after living on the farm and then living on the vineyard for a couple of years, I got very involved in the spiritual movement and wanted to meditate and chant and do yoga and eat microbiotic food and. In the book, I and I, it's called Following the Path. And my path with this, was this guy named Baba Ramdas, who was my guru, also known as Richard Alpert. He and Timothy Leary started handing acid out to Harvard students back in the late 60s and were kicked out of Harvard. Uh, and then Ramdas went over to India and became an Eastern religious freak and then came back to America and started teaching a lot of Eastern religion to us Westerners and I dropped, I never was a very uh, religious person, but I got very interested in this movement, the New Age movement. So these pictures are taken of us in various forms of expressing yoga, meditation. I still am interested in this, but not as much as I was. That's Timothy Leary, who told me to tune in, turn on, and drop out, which I'd already done. Oops. Then there was the uh, monetary component. This guy is selling pictures of saints for sale. These are the Hare Krishna people that kind of turned me off. You don't see them around so much anymore, but they would just come around and proselytize. And this is at a spiritual chant that I went to in California. This is the guy leading the chant. 
this is a woman in New York named Hilda, who did a lot of healing as well as meditating. She was a great being. And this is at the Houston Astrodome when a young guru named Guru Maharaji was suddenly anointed as the next coming of Christ. And I never really believed in this hype, but I went down to photograph it as an event. These people were called uh, premies. And that's the guy, he's a little young, now he's probably older, but he's at this point only 15 years old. This is where the spiritual movement started turning me off because it became much less organic and more um, based upon prestige and power and fame and monetary gain, and that bothered me. You heard about all these gurus with hordes of women and them giving the guru all their money and they would drive around all these Cadillacs and it was just exploitative. But back to the home front, this is taken at Hill House Farm in Charlemont, little Sufi dancing, and a yoga lesson. And that's Ram Dass at a chanting in Berkeley. And there's Ram Dass on the vineyard. I really became very attached to this man because he reminded me so much of my father. And he was so wise and all-knowing. Who, who's ever met Ram Dass or knows of him? So you know what I'm talking about. Heard his tapes, read his books, be here now. And I spent a lot of time with him. And he even married me and my wife, Ronnie, in 1977. This was taken recently, like about a month ago. I don't know if any of you know, but he had a really serious stroke about 10 years ago. And, uh, really left him paralyzed on the right side. But he carries on and talks, and his speech is much more impaired now. He's not the charismatic uh, orator that he was, but he still is full of love, and his heart is very open, and he does not complain at all about his physical state. He's in his 80s now. I took this in Maui just about a month ago. And there's Tim Leary again, towards the end of his life. And now we're going to get to the next section, which is probably the, more, the most interesting section, which is these pictures that I've taken through the years of well-known people. And uh, what I did was I had a tremendous interest in music, dating way back, way before my sister became famous. And uh, I used my interest in music to my advantage by taking pictures of these famous musicians for magazines and newspapers. It got all these uh, great photographs because I'd get access backstage and get to know them and kind of weaseled my way into their trust. And uh, I was a well-known music photographer back in the late 60s to the late 70s. So the next group of pictures are all pictures of well-known people to varying degrees taken in my own sort of laid-back, hippie-esque, uh, shoot-from-the-hip style. Nothing really posed, more just a sense of trust between subject and photographer. So this is Joan Baez and Bob Dylan in 1975 during the Rolling Thunder tour. I got the Beatles at Shea Stadium. 1965, I smuggled my camera in and walked up to the front row boxes. I was about 16 when I took this. But I couldn't really hear the music because the teenagers were screaming so loud. That's the Jefferson Airplane during the Summer of Love. This is a funny story. It's Jim Morrison of The Doors, taken in 68. And I'm up front shooting a picture for a magazine called Crawdaddy. And uh, I'm right up there, right underneath him, photographing away. And he chose to throw up right there. <laughs> and he threw up all over me and my camera. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. <laughs> so I had to quickly go out and go to the bathroom and just wipe off the camera with all his vomit on it. 
And if I was smart, I would have bottled it and sold it at all. <laughs> <laughs> now, he was really a very bad drunk and finally died of a drug overdose. This is the first integrated group, uh, the Chambers Brothers. They did a song called, Time Has Come Today. That's Pete Townsend of The Who, way back when. That's Arlo Guthrie and Pete Seeger at a peace rally. The Rolling Stones in Boston in 1969. That's Mick, close up of Mick Jagger. That's Cat Stevens. I was really in love with his music in a big way. And just for, oops. As an aside, that happens to be my sister's underwear hanging up. <laughs> <laughs> she had a brief fling with him. Grateful Dead in Boston, 1968. That was the night I took my first acid trip. And life has not been the same ever since. <laughs> And that's the student strike day where they played a free concert at MIT. And that's Mickey Hart, the drummer. And that's a double exposure of Jerry, my hero. I'd say there are two heroes that I've developed through the years, Jerry Garcia and Bob Marley. And they're both dead, and both have left an incredible stamp on music in my life. And I got to meet them and photograph them and became friendly with both of them. I was really lucky that I got to photograph my idols. But it's just so shameful that they died so young. Here's Jerry hanging out with Mickey Hart and Phil Lesh backstage. He's smoking weed with one hand and a cigarette with the other. <laughs> I call this picture Crazy Fingers. Because he, one of his hands is missing a finger. So, the, how he could get those notes while missing a finger is just unbelievable to me. Here he is backstage with his vices, cigarettes, coffee, later on, hard drugs. A rare group shot of the Grateful Dead. They hated to be photographed in any formal way, but this was for Rolling Stone and it was going to be on the cover. So they thought, all right, all right, we'll give you one shot at it. So. I got the pose for about two minutes, and that was what came out of it. That's a group called Police, so that's Sting in the foreground, taken in 1980. And that's the author John Updike, who was a good friend. I must say we developed a really close relationship. I bet there's some books of his in this library. <laughs> right, Jerry? <laughs> There's Jackie Robinson again, reappearing. This is shortly before he died at a jazz concert that he gave as a fun fundraiser at his home in Stanford, Connecticut. And a little bit bringing it up to date, um, the big monster, Fenway Park, that's Big Poppy and Little Pedro. I am a baseball freak. That's Bill and Hillary Clinton on the vineyard attending Yom Kippur services. With Alan Dershowitz in the background. And that's Arlo Guthrie with Alice of Alice's Restaurant. Taken for Rolling Stone. And that's James Taylor uh, on the vineyard putting some hammers in the background of one of his songs called Mescalito. This was taken in Vermont at the Hippie Commune. One day he and his bride-to-be, my sister Carly, came rambling down our little dirt road with one of those huge um, recreational vehicles. And how they ever got to our farm, I'll never know. But this he came down specifically for me to shoot pictures of it for an album cover. And a different version of this picture appears on his album called One Man Dog. 
And that's Harry's boat, isn't it? <laughs> it is. That's in the beaver pond. That's the young Joni Mitchell. That's Bob Dylan singing Forever Young in San Francisco. That's Miles Davis. Aretha Franklin. Paul Simon singing to a very select crowd. <laughs> Take it for Rolling Stone once again. No, that was in uh, Pennsylvania, actually. That's Bruce with Clarence, who's no longer with us. And that's a very unusual picture that I got of Bruce Springsteen after a concert. Unusual because it's so intimate, and he looks so young. This is a well-known shot of mine. It's of Robert Plant, taken in L.A., where I was doing an assignment for the Atlantic Monthly, of all things, in 1975. And after shooting a lot of pictures inside his hotel suite, I asked him to go out on a balcony overlooking Sunset Strip. And over, you can't see this in the picture, but over to the right there's a big billboard that uh, extols the fact that their new album, Physical Graffiti, was just released. And he took one look at this billboard that was huge, and he just went, God, I am a golden god. And he stretched out his arms spontaneously. And I just happened to photograph it. And this has become a well-known picture of mine. But we didn't have motor drives back then, our camera, so like that was my one shot. He only did that for about five seconds. And fortunately, I got one. And there's Mick Jagger, again, in Boston. And here he is with Peter Tosh singing You Gotta Walk It, Don't Look Back at Saturday Night Live. Now, Mike Wallace just died, as you all know, but this is while he was still alive with his wife, Mary, taken on the vineyard. About eight years ago? And that's William Styron, the author, and Diane Sawyer. John Belushi. He loved to play the drums. And here he is with his wife, Judy, looking at my first book about reggae. And I really turned him on to the world of reggae through that book. That's Bob Dylan. I called his Tangled Up in Pink. <laughs> That's Richie Havens, one of my heroes, also. That's the blues singer, Susan Tedeschi. That's a latter picture of Sting. Who knows who that is? All right. With John Lennon looking over his shoulder. He was taken recently. Our governor. I live in Massachusetts. I really love this guy. I took this just about a year ago. That's Mary Steve version of Ted Danson. Well, I grew up loving Judy Collins, who didn't? And then I got to meet her and hang out with her about five years ago. So it's, it's nice to idolize someone, you know, who's, she's a lot older than me. I'd say she's maybe 10 years older. And then to get to meet her on equal terms, it's pretty amazing. I don't know why we were on equal terms, but we were. There's Pete Seeger. That's Walter Cronkite. This was taken shortly before he died, and he had a very grim view of America by that point. Now, that story about my sister. Walter's wife died, and my sister's husband died within six months of each other. And my sister, being a real estate broker, had sold an apartment to the Cronkites in her same building. And they would always go with the four of them out for dinner and hung out a lot for about five years or so. 
And then when Walter's wife died, um, his manager, office manager, called my sister Joanna and said, Walter's feeling very vulnerable now. Would you mind just calling him up every once in a while and suggesting, you know, you go out to dinner or go to the movies or... And Joey said, sure, of course I would. There's 20 years difference in their age. And uh, so he called up Walter the next day after the memorial for his wife, Betsy. And uh, so Joey says, Walter, would you enjoy some female companionship? I know that you must be feeling bereft and lonely. When would you like to get together? And his deep baritone voice, he says, how about right now? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, she says, well, tonight I'm actually busy, but how about tomorrow night? So she said, fine. So she brought over some uh, shrimp cocktail, and he opens the door and pops champagne, pours her a glass, and said, now I finally have a chance to put the make on you because I've admired you and lusted after you for 10 years. And Joey was like, what? <laughs> And I think she was kind of honored, and, uh, but flabbergasted. And so she said it took him two days before they were in bed together. He being an 80-year-old, 85-year-old man at this point. But she attests that they had great sex, and that they, and she had a great five-year run with him, really. I'd never seen her happier. And it was just a wonderful story of, uh, love in the latter part of one's life and he treated her like royalty they went everywhere together france and yachts and winters in the caribbean and black tie dinners at the plaza hotel and it, she was like queen for half a decade and uh one day she's saying to walter they're walking down the sidewalk in new york and she says walter you're really treated like American royalty. And he says to her, no, you are the queen of American royalty, not me. And that made her just, that just melted her heart completely, that she could be in the same league as Walter Cronkite. And when he died a few years ago, it was very sad. It was a sad death, not unlike that of my father, where he became uh, senile and well, shortly before his death, I went down to New York and visited him with my wife, Ronnie, and he was looking out over uh, the UN Plaza where he lives, over First Avenue, and he says, you know, why they had to build another New York, I don't understand why they had to make two New Yorks. And I said, what, what do you mean by two New Yorks? And he said, well, this New York here isn't the real New York. There's another New York on the other side of the apartment that's the real one. So, all, you know, we just looked at each other, my wife and I, and went, all right, that's the way you see it. I mean, you couldn't explain to him that that was New York that he was looking at, because he was so far gone. Um, so it was interesting to see a man who was so acute and could ask the most amazing questions and be so learned to have gone to that level. It was really an eye-opener. And here I am at his memorial service in New York, and this is the only picture I've ever taken of our president. Uh, so diminutive compared to Walter. That's a picture of Larry David playing poker. He's not a very good poker player, but a lot of fun to have around. And that's Michael J. Fox. And I got to photograph Lady Gaga, of all people. Because her manager came to my gallery. I have a gallery on the vineyard called the Simon Gallery. And he showed up one day a couple of years ago. And I didn't know who he was. He just bought a house on the vineyard. He was a very nondescript, short, black guy, maybe in his 30s. And um, he comes into my gallery and says, I would like to buy this. I'd like to buy this. I'd like to buy this. And I'd like to buy that and that and that. And I thought, this guy's like pulling my leg. Um, because people just don't come into my gallery and just buy $2,000 worth of images. So I said, are you for real? And he said, yeah, I want them. I just bought a house here. 
And I said, well, where are you from? And he said, I come from California. So uh, why do you want all these images? Because I love your photography of the great masters, and I want them for my wall. And I said, well, what do you do? Well, I'm in the music business. So what do you do in the music business? Well, I manage talent. Well, I've heard of some musicians lately. Who do you manage? And he said, Lady Gaga. And I thought, okay, that explains why you have the money for all this. <laughs> I didn't say that to him. But uh, then he offered me uh, to, to go on tour with Lady Gaga and photograph her for a book that they were doing. I had misgivings about it, because uh, I don't really, it's not my kind of music, to be honest. But I know she's such a phenomenon that I took him up on the offer, went to Boston at least. Uh, and, but I all had all these misgivings about doing, being on tour with them for a month, so I decided to test out the waters, and I went up to Boston and did the following three or four shots. But then I have to say that I told him, I said, I really don't think I'm the right guy for this. You should get someone younger who's really into her. He said, you know, I think you're right. <laughs> So whether that book ever came out, I don't know. But here are some pictures of Lady Gaga. I have to admire her because I think she has a good voice, great voice, and she's very unique. How many people in this crowd like her music? One, three. Her duet with Tony Bennett. Yeah, that's good. But he gave me very good photo access. This guy's name is Troy Carter. There's a picture of my wife, Ronnie, who I consider to be a famous person. <laughs> She's a jeweler now and sells this most amazing jewelry. So our gallery is by photography and her jewelry on Martha's Vineyard. Sometimes people come in just for the jewelry. Sometimes they come in just for the photography. And sometimes they come in for both. Now, as I mentioned, I'm Carly Simon's brother, but I like to think of her as being my sister. <laughs> <laughs> this was taken on the Hippie Commune at Tree Frog Farm. Uh, and this became the cover of her first album. But I've been taking pictures of her since she was a little kid. And my father took pictures of us. That's me, my mother, and Carly. And here she is as a teenager, the spiral staircase with a banister at the top. Here she is singing with her sister Lucy, and they're known as the Simon Sisters back in the mid-60s, early 60s. Here she is grabbing a cab uh, in New York on the way to the studio. She's singing John Travolta. This is the cover of her album, Anticipation. her honeymoon photograph of James Taylor. On the way to the studio, pregnant, recording, I think I'm gonna have a baby, was the name of her son. Here's James with her son, Ben Taylor. In the hammock. With Steven Tyler. With Hillary and Bill and her ex-husband, Jim Hart. Dressed up for a Christmas album she put out. A little bit on the sexy side for her brother to take this picture. Performing in Boston, many of you know that she hates to perform, but every once in a while she gets it together. And most recently, a photograph of Carly, uh, her daughter, Sally, that's Ben, and that's my niece, Julie, my sister's daughter. And this was at a su surprise party two years ago that her boyfriend, Richard Kohler, put on for her. She didn't expect to arrive at a boat with 40 people on it to say happy birthday to her. But at least she was excited. That's the end of the little Carly sequence. Um, this is the day the music died for me. Uh, John Lennon's death and subsequent mourning of his passing. 
This is taken in Boston. And the day that reggae died was when Bob Marley died. As I mentioned, I took a lot of pictures of Marley because I did several books about reggae. I got very involved in Jamaican culture and reggae music in particular in the mid-70s. Went to Jamaica any a number, number of times and did three books about reggae. A lot of pictures of Bob it's, are still very popular. A lot of people buy these things. And a lot of people ask me what it was like to get to know him. And you never really could know him because he was always proselytizing. And you never could have like a normal conversation with him. No one could. But you knew that you were in front of a really amazing prophet. Because he was stoned so much of the time as well. But unfortunately he died really young. 1981. He had melanoma on his toe that spread and he could have been saved had he had the toe amputated but he didn't believe in Western medicine and didn't, he thought the jaw would take care of it all but it didn't or he didn't. And that's taken at his funeral of uh, the sadness that pervaded Jamaica and the world of reggae in general. And he's got more legendary as the years have gone by, and a movie just came out about the life of Bob Marley. And a lot of these pictures of, that you see here in the movie. That's his son, Stephen Marley, who looks a lot like Bob Marley. And I went back and visited Bob Marley's uh, museum in Jamaica with my son, Willie. And it was a very moving day, because when I went to Jamaica about five years ago, one of his sons went into the library and brought out all my books about reggae and asked me to sign them. And I was really honored that Bob Marley had collected all these and kept them. So as I was signing them, I started, tears started dropping from my eyes onto the books and Willie was saying, Dad, what are you doing? Why are you being so emotional? And I was saying, I can't help it, Willie. This is like really, an amazing time because I feel like I miss Bob so much and yet he really revered me and uh, can't you understand that? And he looked around and he said, yeah, I get it, I get it. Thank you for bringing me down here. Uh, I think you eventually saw the import of the fact that Bob Marley's legacy lived on in our hearts and souls. But he was embarrassed that I cried and got tears all over the books. That's one of Bob Marley's backup singers named Judy Moat, taken in Jamaica. And that's Jimmy Cliff. As you can see, I've segued into Jamaica at this point. And that's Keith Richard, Nick Jagger, and Peter Tosh, all getting very stoned backstage before going on stage. And here's right after they got all stoned. <laughs> There's Peter Tosh, with his always carrying around a lighted marijuana cigarette, known as a spliff in Jamaica land. And there's Toots of Toots of the Maytals. And that's a current reggae singer called Sizzler. And that's Lee Perry, who's a well-known reggae producer. This is at a little place in the grill that sells psilocybin mushrooms, magic mushrooms for sale. That's Burning Spear, another well-known reggae band. I forget this guy's name. Mr. Perfect, that's his name. And that's Beanie Man. Um, he represents more of the dance hall rap style of reggae that's become so popular that I don't really like it anymore. And that's uh, Richie Spice, one of the newcomers of reggae. Taurus Riley. That's a reggae mobile truck that sells, that used to sell reggae music right out of the truck, kind of like the good humor man of reggae. And that's just a shot 
of daily life in Jamaica, love in the tropics, taken right out of the windshield of a car during a rainstorm. That's in the grill, the differing lifestyles and cultures. And in Jamaica, you just see pictures everywhere. Uh, I've never been to a country where everywhere I looked, there was yet another beautiful, or not beautiful, but well-composed photograph to take. I call this Rasta Rush Hour. <laughs> this is just on the way to Sunday school. The shanty towns of Montego Bay. And that's Kingston, which is just a very dirty city. And uh, there's a lot of homeless and decrepit people living all around in Kingston. Man and his best friend. This guy is making money by um, swallowing kerosene and then he lights a match to it and blows it out and charges $20 for every time he does it. And he, he made a lot of money that day, oddly enough. What a way to make money. Jamaica has its beautiful side. Cumulonimbus in the tropics. That's a Rasta coming out of the water, shaking his dreadlocks. That's a shot of myself while on assignment doing a book about reggae that came out in 2007. The shirt says, keep Austin weird at being Austin, Texas. Meaning that it's the only hip town in all of Texas. This is Last summer, uh, I took my love for reggae and Jamaica, and my son and I developed this fascination with Jamaican food, and we opened up a food truck called Irie Bites. <laughs> That's Seth Meyers from Saturday Night Live with Peter Tosh's uh, widow, Melody, and that's our logo. And now we're getting into the drug part of the lecture tonight. That book came out on 9-11-01. And I'd been a dope pot fiend all my life. Took a little acid, took a little, smoked a lot of weed, but never really did any of the hard drugs. But after that book came out, I became a raging alcoholic because I was so depressed that my book came out on 9-11. And I felt that God had done me in and the, the whole, I just lost faith in the whole boomer movement. I just, all of a sudden, my life that had been so glorious and fun-filled, I got incredibly depressed. And I'd never really been depressed in my life. But the fact that this book came out on that day, I felt that God had done me a bad turn. And uh, of course, I was upset about what happened to the world, but I took it really personally. So I became, a, as I say, a round-the-clock drinker for about five years and eventually had to be hospitalized. I went to jail for DUIs and I went to rehab. And I went through the whole nine yards and then came out of it five, about six months later totally sober and clean. And I go to AA and I do the whole thing about not using substances anymore, but I really learned the hard way. So. Uh, this little section is about drugs and use and abuse, starting in Jamaica, where pot is the big drug of choice. Even the little kids. Here's my son grabbing a little marijuana down there in Jamaica. He doesn't really smoke weed anymore either. This is a pot plantation. Two friends of mine getting stoned. This is in uh, California where pot's basically legalized, medical marijuana. You can go into a, a dispensary now and just pick out whatever type of marijuana you want. These are all different, different uh, strains, I guess you'd call it. All you need is a prescription and in Venice, California, they have a little 
walk-in clinic where you just say, oh, I've got a bad back. And they say, sure, here, you can get some medical marijuana, no problem. So it's basically the way that marijuana has become legalized, which is about time, I might say, when you consider that alcohol is legal and nicotine is legal, which are much more harmful than marijuana in my opinion. It's doing a line of cocaine and drunkenness at a party in Boston. <laughs> this is taken in New Orleans, the French Quarter. And at a bar in New Orleans. And a bar on the vineyard, clean up time. Young kids drinking it up. Skid Row in San Francisco. This is what I feel drug, constant drug use leads to, which is basically dysfunction. This guy was asking me for money so he could get some more crack. This was a scary picture to take. He leaned into my window and said, I need money. I need to get a fix. I'm going to die. I'm fixing to die. So here I was not knowing whether to give him money to take his picture or just ram on the uh, accelerator and get out of there because I felt my life was in danger. But then I decided I couldn't pass up the opportunity, so I took his picture and then paid him $10, enabling, enabling him to get his fix of whatever he was on. But I, I just felt I needed to take the picture because he looked so crazed. This is a homeless guy in San Francisco. And this is a, a woman, a mother of a young kid. Um, while the kid's in one merry-go-round horse, she's in the other one drinking. I just couldn't believe it. This is a girl taken at rehab where she was just about to get out. I was in rehab for six months. I was really pretty far gone. I mean, I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm happy to admit it, but a lot of people don't make it out of there alive. This is a 12-step program meeting that I went to. And this guy was just sort of, I don't know, very dysfunctional person taken in uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico. This brings on the next set of pictures, by the way. We've left the pot and the alcohol behind, and uh, we're getting towards the last part of the presentation. So keep your questions in mind. Uh, this is taken in Puerto Rico. And what I'm gonna show you here is just a bunch of travel shots that I've taken over the past few years. I picked up where I left off uh, after I got sober and just traveled far and wide and took a lot of pictures, mostly of dysfunction, I might say, but not all. 